Hi, my name is Dr. Sam Sunshine, and I'm coming to you from OC Sports and Wellness, which is a family and sports medicine practice here in Foothill Ranch in Orange County, California. And today's topic is going to be on insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the opposite of insulin sensitivity. We want to have insulin sensitivity, meaning that this molecule called insulin is working and that our cells are responding to it. So I'll talk a little bit about insulin resistance today. Um, that's where our body doesn't respond to the circulating insulin. And it's a problem because it's a precursor for type 2 diabetes. And it's associated with a lot of um, chronic illness, such as diabetes and heart disease um, and others like Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, I see this a lot in my practice. Again, most people don't know they have insulin resistance because we typically don't have symptoms. You can have symptoms, however, if you develop type 2 diabetes, like increased thirst, increased urination, weight loss. Um, some people say that maybe there are some symptoms of insulin resistance uh, early, which is like a pre-diabetes condition where maybe you might feel lethargic or fatigued. Um, you might gain weight. And the question is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Because being overweight is uh, directly associated with developing insulin resistance. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll get, we'll get started here. And again, this is the purpose of this is for education. And I hope you enjoy it. Um, and again, if you have questions and you're part of my membership, please, uh, please let me know. But this is something I'll be sending to you if you have this condition, which is super common, about a third of adults. OK. So the title is Insulin Resistance. Don't take this diagnosis sitting down. And as I'll talk about later, one of the treatments is being active. So what was interesting in my research in this topic is that when you look at this timeline, this is PubMed, which is available online. If you go to pubmed.com, you can find research articles that have been published. And it's not until about 2000 that we started to see interest in this condition called insulin resistance. And you can see that huge uptake or it increase in published articles. That's, uh, these are the published articles. And it's, it's really one of the defining medical challenges of the 21st century is how do we deal with insulin resistance, which is like a pre-diabetes and even type 2 diabetes, which we cannot get controlled um, in the United States and in a lot of developed countries. Um, the incidence continues to go up and has for 40 years and we're not able to curtail it. And it's costing uh, on the, our country's you know, uh, billions of dollars in, in medications and care for people who have diabetes. So really, uh, this is a great quote by Les Brown that I like, um, accept responsibility for your life. Know that it is you who will get you where you want to go, no one else. So I think that's really important when we talk about health. I often say there's no off season. I mean, it's not that you can try to get into shape for the summer and then take the winter off and gain weight and become sick, or at least stay healthy, make it a, uh, a personal quest to do things every day to stay healthy, whether that's eating nutritiously, moving your body, getting adequate sleep, meditating. So what is insulin? It's a peptide, which is a strung together um, amino acids. It's also a hormone and it's made by our pancreas, which sits right behind the stomach in our upper abdomen and it secretes, um, or it's, it's secreted by the, by the pancreas, kind of shown here in that slide, a picture, as those blue cubes in response to ingesting proteins or carbohydrates. Usually ingesting fat doesn't promote insulin secretion by the pancreas. So what does it do? It binds to receptors on certain cells in our body, primarily skeletal muscle, liver, and white adipose or white fat cells. And insulin signals, uh, <laughs> it's misspelled cells, so it should be C-E-L-L-S, cells, cells of our body to take up glucose, which is one of the main substrates we use for energy. We use glucose, ketones, or fat for energy. And it can also be stored as glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose that we can use later on for energy. Super important that we have this functioning normally. 
And as I'll discuss, uh, unfortunately, type 2 diabetes and, and insulin resistance um, really is a continuum. You develop insulin resistance. If you don't make changes to your lifestyle, you're gonna ultimately develop type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes are both potentially reversible. You just gotta change the path you're on. And I'll tell you that, um, again, it's, it's very common. And if you don't heed the warning, if you have insulin resistance, you need to make changes in your lifestyle, um, you're gonna develop type two diabetes, which has a lot of potential downside and the associated chronic illnesses that are associated with having insulin resistance and type two diabetes are things you wanna avoid. So if for those, for those uh, um, biology and cell biology geeks out there, this is kind of how insulin, which is that green circle at the top, binds to this insulin receptor, which is found on the, on the cell surface. And then the cascade of things that really happen after that insulin molecule binds to that insulin receptor. And uh, I think it's fascinating. So there's so many players that participate in the function of insulin binding to the receptor and then taking up, allowing the cell to take up blood sugar. So in essence, the insulin is knocks on the door of these muscle and fat liver cells and says, hey, we've got blood sugar here, you need to take it up. And in a healthy person, the cells welcome the blood sugar in. But in unhealthy people who have unhealthy liver and muscle cells, they don't hear that, they don't hear the knocking on the door. And so they don't take up the glucose. And so glucose rises. And that's not what we want. We want to have controlled blood sugar. So what is the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control? It's been in the news, right? A lot of CDC information about COVID-19 this past year. But one of the quotes is, if you have insulin resistance, you want to become the opposite. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well put. Um, this is as of 2015. Again, they have more updated information. This was one article I was reading. More than 30 million Americans have diabetes. Again, that's the consequence of first having insulin resistance and developing type 2 diabetes. Um, about 84.1 million have insulin resistance. So combining the two, it's about, it's about a third of the US population has either insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. And diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States and growing. It's gonna be probably in the top four soon. Um, and more than a third of US adults have insulin resistance. And this is a according to Brenda Fitzgerald, she's the CDC director. And what's interesting is only about 11.6% of people with insulin resistance even know they have the condition. And I know when I talk to my patients, I have never had a patient when I'm reviewing their labs and say, you know, you have insulin resistance that they know they have insulin resistance because we don't typically measure our blood sugar and our insulin at home. So this just kind of shows the population variation of people with type two diabetes. Um, the far left is native Americans. Um, the, the tan bar is men and the blue bar is women. Again, they have the highest amounts, um, Asians, and, uh, and white non-Hispanics lower rates, but the black and Hispanics also have a higher rates of diabetes and higher rates of heart disease and kidney failure and all the things that go along with having high circulating glucose, which is not what we want. So this is from the CDC 2020, a little bit more updated, looking at insulin resistance and there's the United States, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and it shows 2004, 2008, 2016, and the uh, percentages of people with insulin resistance, the darker the color, the higher the percentage in that population with insulin resistance. And the, the dark blue is 12.2 to 33% of that population with insulin resistance. Um, so again, you can see the entire United States population just is getting darker, a darker blue shade. And really no states are spared. Uh, so again, this is a uh, a problem that's really nationwide and really universal. So how do we measure it? So there's a lot of scientific ways to measure insulin resistance. Um, but the simplest way is measuring your fasting blood sugar 
and measuring your fasting insulin, and you put it into a calculation. Put those two numbers into a calculation, it gives a result. Again, there are scientific ways to do it where they do, um, they do clamping of the blood and they give you insulin and then see how quickly you respond by measuring blood sugar. Again, way too complex and beyond the scope of today's lecture, really unnecessary when we have the uh, HOMA IR calculation that's easy. Other people can measure adiponectin and leptin level or ratios, but again, I think this is the easiest way. So again, multiplying fasting glucose and fasting insulin. A normal uh, HOMA IR, again, homo, homeos, HOMA IR means um, the homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance is 1.0. And the normal range is anywhere from 0.5 to 1.4. If you have early resistance, you have a HOMA IR greater than 1.9. And if you have significant insulin resistance, um, it's greater than 2.9. And again, every week in my, in my practice, and I generally have healthy people or health conscious people in my membership, uh, have insulin resistance. And um, it's something, again, that we can address. So this is the equation that you can get online. And you plug in the insulin number and the glucose number, and you hit enter, and it gives you a number. And so it's insulin in picomolars per liter divided by six, and glucose in millimoles per liter uh, divided by or multiplied by 18. So again, so you have a general idea of how that's done. So life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And that's a big uh, um, pledge that I try to make to patients. You know, moving is so important. And uh, I thought he captured it well in that quote. So if we compare insulin resistance to insulin sensitivity, I haven't used that term yet, I don't think is insulin sensitivity, but I think it's important to know what insulin sensitivity is and how it compares to insulin resistance. But Insulin uh, resistance, or IR, is too much insulin. So your body's got to make, or your pancreas has to make more insulin to overcome um, our body's inability to recognize that the insulin's there. And that leads to inflammation, and it leads to weight gain, among other things. There's a lot of other things that happen when insulin goes up. It wreaks havoc um, on multiple biologic systems. Insulin sensitivity, or IS, is lower levels of circulating insulin and it's associated with lower inflammation in the body. Insulin resistance is often caused by poor lifestyle habits. Insulin sen sensitivity is typically patients who have healthy lifestyle habits. Insulin resistance, higher risk of hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, fatigue, just to name a few. Again, emphasizing, again, fatigue, something that a lot of us have. And so really making sure your blood sugar is controlled making sure you don't have early or significant insulin resistance. And then again, the last one, insulin sensitivity, lower risk for all of these chronic illnesses. So what are the causes of insulin resistance? There's really a couple, there's genetics and then there's environment. And environment is, is lifestyle, essentially. Um, the first one is there's genetic variants that do exist and they keep discovering more and more genetic variants. So when I showed that early slide, there was that complex picture of how insulin binds to the receptor and all those other players are involved in that whole mechanism of signaling the cell that, hey, insulin's bound to the receptor. They all have a role to play. There are genetic um, mutations that happen. Some of these are these single nucleotide polymorphisms um, like PP, AR gamma and KLF 14. There's, there's hundreds, it sounds like, when I, in the literature, it seems like that there are more and more they're discovering, um, but those probably account for a very small amount of, of people who have insulin resistance. Um, and they are common variants, and they not only affect the action of insulin, but also the way that glucose is metabolized. But really, the majority of people with insulin resistance have an overconsumption problem, and they're overconsumption, uh, consuming these very inexpensive, calorically dense food. That's like fast food. That's not what we want. <laughs> Obesity. Um, other causes of insulin resistance are medications. A lot of people don't realize that uh, diuretics, like thiazide diuretics, which is common, um, it can predispose people. And these are thiazide diuretics are used as an, a blood pressure lowering medication. Um, they are common. Just because you're on one doesn't mean you 
are going to develop insulin resistance, but it may increase your risk. And you don't want to stop a medication if you're like, oh my gosh, I have insulin resistance and I'm on one of these medications. You want to discuss that with your doctor first. Um, beta blockers, another commonly used medication, lower blood pressure, statins, you know, millions of people, tens of millions of people take statins and it does increase your risk for developing insulin resistance and diabetes. And uh, corticosteroids are just, just to name a few, there's, there's several other medications that can increase insulin resistance. And then of course, aging. As we get older, our risk for developing insulin resistance goes up in almost a linear uh, fashion. So this slide, I'm not sure who I pirated, pirated this one from, but uh, kind of sum summarizes you know, the causes of insulin resistance. It's really an interplay between genetics and environment, as I mentioned. In the genetics, it could be an abnormal insulin, abnormal insulin receptor, or abnormal signaling pathway, where some of these proteins are mutated. And then there's in the environmental, abdominal obesity, aging, medications, hyperglycemia, which again is high blood sugar, um, increased free fatty acids like triglyceride levels, and then people with uh, hepatitis C virus infection. And what does this do? It leads to insulin resistance, which is hyperglycemia, which again is high blood sugar, hyperinsulinemia, which is high circulating insulin. And you also will see low adiponectin and low leptin levels. I won't get into those too much. It kind of goes beyond the scope of this. So what are ways to improve insulin resistance? It's really lifestyle. And I always say, you know, optimal health is, is not a part-time job. It's something you want to think about every day. So the first thing you want to do is stop overnutrition. And this is a word I learned during my research for this talk. And it's really the overconsumption of calorically dense food, like fast food, sugar, candy, pastries, things like that. Um, you might think about doing some caloric restriction through time-restricted eating. You know, having a feeding window of six to eight hours and don't eat outside that window. It's something you can start with maybe a 10 or 12 hour window and over time, lower that that window. Intermittent fasting. Uh, there's so many different ways you can look this up online and find out maybe there's one type of intermittent fasting that works best for you. you know, maybe you don't want to do a seven day water fast every quarter, but maybe two days out of the week, you find that that might be reasonable. Um, caloric restriction really in any form, you know, any form. You know, when you do body composition analysis and people want to lose weight, we just take their total energy expenditure and subtract 500 calories for that and set up a meal plan where they're trying to consume that total number of calories, which is total energy expenditure minus 500 calories. And that's their goal caloric intake for the day. So caloric restriction does help. Um, again, weight loss, one of the best ways is caloric restriction, but also exercising, um, reducing stress. And then of course, exercise. So I have this picture on the, um, on the right, the thing I like about it really depicts different forms of exercise. And I'll get into that in just a second. But first there's resistance training and that's lifting weights, kind of the guy in the middle, lifting weights. Um, and again, you can be doing um, high intensity interval training during weights, but sometimes just weight, weight lifting, weight training where you do reps um, and then rest in between your, your reps uh, or your sets. And uh, that's, what, that's what's called resistance training and doing that a couple, couple days a week. Uh, there are people who lift weights seven, six or seven days a week, and that's fine. Oftentimes they rotate body parts. So not doing the same body part seven days in a row, that'll lead to overuse injuries. And then they'll be seeing me for other reasons. Patients will be seeing me for other reasons like injury. And then there's high intensity interval exercise. I try to explain this to patients. You can start low again, maybe twice a week three times a week max. Again, you don't want to develop any overuse injuries, but it can be something as easily as running in place for 30 seconds and then resting for 30 seconds or a minute and doing that four to six times um, after an easy warm up. You don't want to start a high intensity exercise workout without warming up first and then do that four to six times and then cool down um, and do some mild stretching. And you can get this done in 20 minutes try to do it twice a week, but I have so many patients who have so many excuses why they can't work out. And you don't even need equipment. 
you can just do your own body weight and do a high intensity exercise or resistance workout without any equipment in the in the um, confines of your own home or just at the, a local park. So in summary, insulin resistance is a reversible condition, something you don't have to have, but it's oftentimes going to take a change in your lifestyle path to a healthier path. But really it's eat less, exercise more, following a plant-based diet. I really didn't get into this, but these are nutrient dense foods as opposed to calorically dense foods, which we mostly eat. Standard American diet, calorically dense foods, very low in plant-based nutrition. But this is where we get a lot of vitamins and minerals. Obtain regular fasting labs, like every three months. If you have insulin resistance or type two diabetes, you should be getting lab work um, every three to four months until you get it under control, whether it's through lifestyle changes or medications or a combination of both, but you don't wanna just not know where, you know, are you improving? Are you going in the right direction? I also recommend body composition analysis, looking for visceral fat. Um, we use a bioelectrical impedance machine. It's kind of a high-end machine called the Acunic. Most of you, if you're a member of my practice, you're getting that hopefully, at least a couple times a year to keep an eye on things. And then work with a knowledgeable clinician, um, like myself, somebody who understands this. Um, it does take a lot of explaining and that's why I'm making this podcast today so you can listen to this. And if you have any questions, please let me know. So I've seen in my talk. Again, thank you for listening on insulin resistance.